Uh, at 2 p.m. on the 10th of November 1712, 11 men gathered in the Lincolnshire town of Spalding. They discussed the provision of books for the local school, considered a 12th century funerary inscription, and probably led, led, uh, read the latest issue of The Spectator before going their separate ways as the night drew in. We know all of this because it was the first formally minuted meeting of a group known as the Spalding Gentlemen Society, or SGS, which had begun to meet informally two years earlier at a local coffee house. Founded by Morris Johnson, a lawyer born in 1688 who had just returned uh, from his legal training in London, these informal gatherings, uh, as he later wrote, drew the men of sense and letters into a sociable way of conversing. It was Johnson's hope to replicate the dynamic coffeehouse gatherings he had enjoyed in London, uh, where he met Addison and Steele, uh, editors of The Tatler and Spectator, uh, and Alexander Pope. That his society flourished uh, for 45 years um, in a provincial town in the Fens might surprise the casual observer. Um, in fact, it still exists after the Ashmolean Museum, the oldest museum in the land. But the Sporting Gentleman Society was, from the start, uh, an outward-looking group, uh, part of an extensive reciprocal network of personal and institutional connections, not least with the society in whose rooms we meet today. Furthermore, as we will see, its provincial setting allowed it to flourish in ways uh, itinerant metropolitan uh, societies were not able to do. The Spalding to which Johnson returned from legal training in London as a young man in 1710 uh, was a prosperous town of 2,500 people. Two markets each week brought people from the nearby towns of Boston and Stamford, and the marketplace uh, itself was and remains the location of the White Hart Inn, uh, the greatest inn in the town. Like many inns in the 18th century, the White Hart um, had turned one of its rooms into a coffee house uh, run by the proprietor's wife, uh, Catherine Rishton, one, one of a number of women who make uh, an impact on this otherwise male society. It was here that the SGS held its first uh, uh, formal meetings, uh, creating a structure which included uh, treasurer, secretary, president, and later an operator uh, who curated the collection of instruments um, and encouraging its members, quote, improvement in the liberal sciences and polite learning. The archival records of the early SGS, kept in the present museum building uh, since 1910, are an astonishing survival. Most significant are six volumes of illustrated minutes covering the first half of the 18th century and dealing with uh, and detailing discussions at weekly meetings, their links with other societies uh, and books and objects that were presented. The earliest minutes, which cover the winter of uh, 1712 and 13, uh, show the range of subjects in which the group was interested. Some were distinctly antiquarian, um, medieval methods of making paint, the origins of a medieval chapel near Spalding, and monastic seals. Others point to their general curiosity, uh, including an account of a journey by local men to Bath, um, and another of the history of side saddle riding. Sometimes we see practical learning at the fore, uh, from fen drainage, which is a, a natural interest in, in Lincolnshire, um, to methods of taking impressions of coins and medals, uh, an innovation key in the gentlemanly world of coin collecting. Thanks to Johnson's preservation of the society's institutional memory, uh, the SGS archive acts today as a window upon a significant period of intellectual endeavour. These archives show the SGS to have been a pioneer among learned societies in the 18th century, and it's by considering its connections with the Society of Antiquaries and, of course, the archival records that I've used here um, that I will show the SGS as an independent and dynamic institution. Now, the SGS is often considered a kind of diminutive offshoot of the Society of Antiquaries. Um, in a letter to Johnson in June 1718, his countryman, William Stukeley, uh, noted that one of the Gale brothers had referred to SGS meetings as, quote, a cell to the mitre, um, and, of course, that, as we've seen, is the tavern on Fleet Street where the antiquaries first met. The word cell appears again in the Antiquaries Minute Book uh, for the 14th of November 1722, uh, which refers to the SGS as, quote, a cell or subordinate to ours. The term cell, presumably deriving from the monastic sense of uh, an institution dependent on some larger house, is frequently used by both societies. But in reality, there was no sense of dependency, though the two were very closely tied. And of course, the SGS uh, concerned itself with a much wider range of subjects than the antiquaries. 
But the links between the two uh, societies are very strong. Uh, of the 23 uh, men who, who refounded the Society of Antiquaries in 1717, eight were already or would go on to become uh, members of the SGS. And 15%, or 61, of the nearly 400 individuals who were members of the SGS up to 1760 uh, were also members here. Most were members of the London Society first, um, and then presumably encouraged by Johnson uh, to join the SGS too. Um, but several were uh, members of the SGS to begin with. Among these were George Lynn Jr. and William Bogdani, uh, both of whom married members of Johnson's family and were proposed by Johnson as members of the Antiquaries at the same meeting in November 1726. Johnson was especially close to William Stukeley, uh, the Antiquaries' first secretary, whom he introduced to the Society in June 1717 and whose full-length portrait you may have seen on the stairs uh, on the way up to the library. Born in Holbeach, eight miles east of Spalding, Stukeley lived in London during the early part of his career as a physician uh, and was a member of the SGS from 1722. In 1719, Johnson wrote to his friend of his desire uh, to keep up his end of the scholarly pact. Um, and he wrote, uh, I shall ever be most ready to serve you in anything perpetually bearing you in mind. The SGS, in its Pendulum setting, 20 miles from the nearest city and a two-day coach ride from London, looked outwards almost from the very beginning. From January 1713-14, it allowed the admission of 14 extra-regular members, as it called them, who would not pay regular fees, but instead would present books to the local church or grammar school libraries to the value of one pound. By the end of the decade, the extra-regular members included a fellow of St John's College, Cambridge, William Clark, and the Wisbeach physician, uh, Richard Middleton Massey, who later moved to London and became a member of the Antiquaries in 1718. Later on, such great names as Anders Celsius, Hans Sloan and even Isaac Newton uh, would join the list of, uh, of these corresponding members. Such members allowed the SGS to harness the correspondence of those who lived far enough away from Spalding that regular attendance at meetings was impossible. A letter from Massey upon his election in 1724 gives uh, thanks to your honourable society for the honour uh, you have done me and promises the present of a mint plant for the society's garden. It goes on to mention, quote, my good friend Dr. Tanner's piece, that's Thomas Tanner's revision of his 1695 Metitia Monastica, about which Johnson definitely asked. It is three years since I saw anything of it, said Massey, but if you can tell him where any ledgers or books of accounts of any religious houses are, and in whose hands, I believe the additions will be of that sort. Massey's honorary membership of the SGS uh, provided another group for Johnson on behalf of the SGS to keep his ear to the ground, formalising uh, the private relationships that he already had. Indeed, Johnson did send some material to Tanner, uh, which was included in the book, um, though the book itself took another 20 years to appear, about 10 years after Tanner himself had died. The letters sent by corresponding members to Spalding were a vital part of the weekly meetings. By 1731, the society was in such good health uh, that Johnson could write to Stukeley that uh, we are so strong as to have three or four letters at a time uh, communicated from one member or others. Correspondence, he continued, is the thing that best keeps up the spirit of such societies. The novelty of a letter excites the curiosity of all who know the writer, besides there are usually some modern occurrence interwoven. It was not just antiquarian uh, or scientific information which interested the men, uh, but news of all sorts of modern occurrence, uh, and probably gossip too. Their society was multifaceted, both in its interests and in its structure. Such an outward-facing mindset, uh, and I hope I'll be forgiven for saying this in these rooms, uh, was not uh, present at the early Society of Antiquaries, um, which focused very much on a narrower field of interest um, and looked inwards, um, focusing on the desires of those men who attended meetings more a gentleman's club for showing off new acquisitions uh, than a society for discovery and learning, as it would later become when it began publishing numismatic monographs uh, in the, in the mid-1730s. Fellow of the Antiquaries, oh no, that's the next one. Fellow of the uh, Antiquaries, uh, Dr John Ward, spoke in 1755 of those early days. Um, and he says that their more immediate object uh, seems to have been rather their own entertainment and mutual advantage arising from these conferences. 
than any prospect which they could then have of communicating their researches to the public. Soon after the formal creation of the Society of Antiquaries in 1717, uh, Johnson wished to have his brother John admitted. Among gets a sense that members were expected to hold their own in what, pro what was probably quite a boisterous society of men, uh, some of them very eminent, um, for Johnson fears that his brother wouldn't really fit in. He wrote to Stukeley that, quote, uh, though he is in town with me, he is so very modest that I could never bring him along. One of the antiquaries' more outward-looking ventures was the production and sale of prints of antiquities and, and uh, architectural scenes. Um, but even this endeavour was more for the benefit of members who received copies for free uh, than for public edification. John Talman, the Society's first director, wrote in March 1724-5 to the treasurer Samuel Gale, I'm pleased to hear that such persons as dukes uh, buy whole sets of our prints, he wrote, uh, but at the same time I'm chagrined to reflect on the smallness of their number. As late as 1739, the antiquaries debated the publishing of prints of objects brought to meetings by members, uh, suggesting that this internal focus was hard to shake off even 20 years on. It was also much less keen to widen its membership than the SGS. The antiquaries reached 100 members in January 1737-8, and calls to increase the number in that year and in 1745 were rejected, before in 1746 the number was raised to 120. It should be said that the SGS had a much smaller pool of potential regular members on which to draw than the antiquaries, uh, and that was one of the chief reasons why it had these corresponding members. Certainly Roger Gale, uh, founder, member and vice president of the antiquaries, uh, did not see an increase in numbers to be beneficial, uh, as he pointed out when he accepted Johnson's invitation to become an honorary member of the SGS uh, in 1728. I'm sure ours here, i.e. the antiquaries, is not advantaged by its numbers, he wrote. Few will carry on any work better than a multitude, who for the most part are only a clog and a dead weight upon the industrious. Calls of the antiquaries in the mid-1720s to create honorary members were similarly rejected, uh, and the absence of a mechanism to deal with, uh, with these uh, members leaving London uh, led to the departure of members um, from the society, including William Stukeley's brother, uh, who resigned in, in July 1721 uh, when he went to live in the country. It was only in 1736 that, quote, foreigners of eminent note and learning uh, were admitted on an honorary basis. Conversely, the SDS was keen to draw a knowledge from as far afield as possible, and in his correspondence, Johnson shows off his networks and shares with the antiquaries the knowledge that they would not ordinarily be able to come by. One example is seen in the summer of 1743, when his son, also Morris, uh, then on a military expedition in Germany, sends back information and drawings of two funerary inscription he, uh, inscriptions he has found uh, in uh, the city of Worms. Johnson reads his son's account uh, of these to the SGS in September that year, and writes to Roger Gale to ask for his opinion, um, because the fragmentary nature of, of the inscriptions made the transcription and translation difficult. Gale replied at the end of October to say that it is strange that the inscriptions, quote, are placed so openly in a great city, uh, but have evaded notice by any of the great recorders of such things, um, because he cannot find them in Jan Gruter's 1603 collection of Roman inscriptions, uh, a book evidently not accessible to Johnson, um, or, quote, any other of our collectors of inscriptions. This is noted at the next SGS meeting on the 3rd of November, when Johnson copies down Gale's transcription and records uh, that, uh, quote, his learned explanation much illustrates those ancient and very grand and elegant monuments, um, which uh, he thinks are related to Roman cavalry soldiers. This hitherto unrecorded inscription is clearly of interest to the antiquaries, who asked Johnson for a copy to place in their register, uh, which is the book sitting uh, on the table just here, um, and the drawing is annotated by uh, Johnson, um, quote, as the Society of Antiquaries was pleased to desire it, I made this copy for them, um, the sort of act which would have incurred a debt of reciprocity. This episode underlines the collaborative nature of antiquarianism and the importance of sharing evidence, uh, especially images, a subject Johnson raised a few years later with William Stukeley. Nothing is more edifying and pleasant uh, than ingenious accounts of ancient monuments so illustrated by sketches or drafts of them. 
Uh, they save many words uh, and make stronger and more adequate impressions than words alone can. Correspondence between individuals was, from 1737, supplemented by a formal link between uh, Spalding and the Antiquaries, um, when Johnson began the quarterly exchange of minutes with this society and the Royal Society. Johnson's letter to Alexander Gordon, um, uh, who was the secretary here, establishing this arrangement in August uh, 1737 contains much of interest. And there's lots here, so I'm not going to read it out, but I've highlighted the key uh, points. Um, and we see Johnson flattering Gordon's communicative gen generous spirit and laying bare the honour he feels in their acquaintance, before going on to underline his own personal connection to the antiquaries as one of the restorers of that set of company whose rules he'd helped to form. His desire to communicate formally with the antiquaries is not presented uh, as a selfish one, but one inspired by the request of the Royal Society to do the same. He offers the humble service of all our society uh, in Spalding and his own to our friends at the Mitre. In these words, Johnson presents this new venture not as an imposition from outside, but a mutually beneficial one to which, as a founder member of the antiquaries, he is entitled. The personal connection between uh, society secretaries is also seen in the way Johnson usually signs off his letters uh, as your loving brother secretary. Networks of correspondence were key when the SGS uh, wanted to bring Spalding and Lincolnshire more broadly to the notice of the Society of Antiquaries. It was of course natural for the SGS to take a special interest in the literary, archaeological and architectural antiquities of their local area. Indeed, their connection to place is central. Objects are frequently retrieved from uh, the River Welland, which runs through Spalding, uh, or from the site of Spalding's medieval priory, tying them very much to the history of the town. But it would appear from what Johnson thinks worthy of uh, sending to the antiquaries that this local evidence uh, was used to bring Johnson's part of the world to the fore uh, in the minds of antiquaries' members. Further still, local evidence was used to connect Spalding with the, with the national history. One such example shows the range of networks uh, in use um, and uh, concerns the coat of arms on uh, the vicarage door uh, in Boston Church. Uh, Boston is the, the largest um, uh, settlement in, 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 in that part of the world. Uh, the SGS discussed this on the 7th of October, 1736, uh, and the account is accompanied in the minutes by drawing of the arms, uh, the group at a loss to identify them. Six months later, uh, on the 7th of April, 1737, the subject is raised again. We see nearly a full page of information in pursuit of their identity, uh, including this more detailed drawing uh, and a discussion of its symbols, references to printed books which might identify them, and a discussion of the church's connection to the priors of St John of Jerusalem, uh, which Johnson believes is their origin. As he often did, Johnson takes the subject up with Roger Gale, uh, an example of Johnson using his informal correspondence network to answer an SGS inquiry, whose findings are related back to the antiquaries in his selection of minutes. That learned gentleman, that's Gale, seems to think that the coat of arms carved on the vicarage door at Boston belongs to the Abbey of Bardney in this county. Pray ask our friend Mr New, uh, and let me know whose arms they are taken to be, either of him or any heraldical member of the antiquaries. In this example, Spalding is connected to the nation's monastic heritage uh, by the study of arms, and the SGS's connection with Roger Gale, a founder member like Johnson of the Society of Antiquaries, is made clear. The SGS frequently engages the assistance of their brethren at the Mitre, uh, and here we see Johnson throwing out the inquiry um, accompanied by a detailed description to his colleagues in London. As I come towards my own conclusion, we find Johnson too winding down and considering the future of his society's connections with London. He appears not to have attended the Antiquaries after uh, 1746, finding the two-day journey too taxing, though he continued to send updates on SGS progress. In March 1749, his son Walter was admitted here, prompting Johnson to write uh, to the President Martin Folkes, um, the only individual ever to have been present, uh, uh, president of this society and the Royal Society, uh, who watches us uh, from the dark um, behind the screen on the right. Um, uh, he noted uh, that, quote, no other father has wished the continuance of his family in a set of company where he himself had taken so much delight. 
1754, Johnson, now one of the most uh, senior surviving members of the antiquaries, received a letter from the Huguenot antiquary uh, and fellow, um, Andrew Du Carroll, asking for information on the origins of this society. Du Carroll was most deferential, noting that, quote, nobody can have greater regard for the learned society of antiquaries than yourself, and asking Johnson to oblige our learned and flourishing society. He was, of course, only too pleased to help. A year later, in 1755, Johnson was dead, and the antiquaries recorded, quote, the loss of so valuable a member. Stukeley's oration on his friend underlined the importance of Johnson's and his society's work for his native town and county, which was, quote, forever obliged to his care and diligence, who has rescued them from oblivion. But Johnson and his Spalding Society had done much to aid the work of the antiquaries too, copying images from the Spalding Minute Books for the antiquaries' own records, helping to ensure that the early history of this society was properly recorded, and sharing new discoveries uh, gleaned through its extensive reciprocal network of personal and institutional connections.